An unknown writer once said, we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. We have more conveniences, but less time. We have more knowledge, but less judgment. We have fancier houses, but broken homes. We clean up our air, but we willfully pollute our souls. We travel to the moon and back, but not to our neighbors. We add years to life, but not life to years. Allow me to take liberty tonight and add three phrases to this stalwart introduction from this unknown writer. Let me add these three things. Number one, we have a lot of doctrines, but we don't have enough truth. We have many church buildings, but not enough sanctuaries. We have an abundance of pews and chairs in our facilities, but we don't have enough altars. It was David who had that mesmerizing experience as he longed for the sanctuary of God who wrote in Psalm 27 and 4, David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that. That, that, that will I seek after, that I may abide, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I want to behold his beauty. I want to behold his majesty. I want to look at his splendor and his glory. I want to watch the glory, but I want to be caught up in the glory. But also, I want to inquire in the temple. You know, it's one thing to be in the temple, but it's another thing to inquire in the temple. And one of the greatest challenges that we see today in the modern-day Christian church is that people would rather look at the beauty of the church rather than inquire in the temple. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered nowadays, but not enough people are willing to be disciplined enough to sit down, be taught and trained and receive some understanding so that they might be uh, enlightened about the things of God. You can inquire in the temple. Have a lot of churches, but not enough people who have preachers who teach them to inquire. If you want to know what God is saying in his holy word, God will show you to your man of God as he expounds upon the word of God as God's expositor and wordsmith. He will show you what the scriptures are saying and make it plain. But people nowadays don't want things to be plain. They just want it to be simple and convenient. When I came to Jesus, I had to learn some complex things. You know, holiness is complex. I had to learn how to deal with John, fight the devil, and deal with John. That's complex. Hello, somebody. Look at here. Psalm 26 and 8 says, Oh, Lord, I love the house where you dwell. Love that place where you reside. The place where your glory resides. My God. Somebody going to fall back in love with church tonight. Psalm 84 and 10 reads, for better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. One day in God's glory where his spirit resides is greater than a thousand days here on this dying earth. I would rather be a doorkeeper. I don't need no high seat. I don't need no position. I don't need anything like that. Just let me be a doorkeeper. Let me greet the people as they come in and Go out in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. You know, I have the distinct honor to serve here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ and to be a full-time employee. And I'm blessed to have that 
opportunity. That is a privilege and not a right. And I'm grateful for it, Bishop Wooden. But throughout the course of the week and throughout the course of the day, I have the opportunity as well to come into the sanctuary when no one is in here. To walk around and to find a spot wherever I want to. Fall on my face. Lay prostrate before the Lord, not have to worry about anyone stopping me, moving me over. Sometime the maintenance crew is in vac vacuum cleaning and straightening up things, getting ready for service, but that doesn't bother me. My face is on the ground. And while being in here, oftentimes, once you walk in, you sense and feel the glory. When no one is in here, Someone is in here, and that someone is the God that dwells between the cherubims. He's in this temple. I go in here and lay my face on the floor. I've been doing this since I was in college. This didn't start, young people, when I became a first assistant. This didn't start when I became a youth pastor. This didn't start when I started driving the vans or became a youth worker. At the age of 19, I altered my class schedule so I could get to the temple and just rest upon the Lord. Elder Cooper, you were there back when Moses Day was there. And Elder Scott Hunter, he would walk around the sanctuary and that was his seat right there. We would be here right in the temple as a young man at 19 and 20. That was the thing that helped me handle the urges of fornication, young people. I changed my schedule so I could get to the house of God because I didn't want to be no phony. Didn't want to just be another suit with five girlfriends. Preaching and tipping and dipping and slipping and doing everything that I can, but misusing, misusing and misappropriating the glory of God. This is my testimony. I tell it for myself. That's what I did with my schedule. I put it on a schedule to go before the Lord. When you come into the sanctuary throughout the course of the day, God is here. This place, this place. Where well, preaching has gone up for years. This place that has been prayed out in the Holy Ghost. This place where sacrifices have been made wanting to the Lord down here at the altar. This place is holy. This place is holy. I've seen demons who were adjured by the power of God, say to Bishop Wooden in this place, man of God, don't touch me because you're too holy. I've witnessed with my own eyes people die, fall asleep in this place, only to see the power of God without a long prayer service without a long hallelujah and father God in the name of Jesus Lord we want you to do this no just rise up in the name of Jesus I've seen some things happen mother wooden in this place in this place you know under armor had a slogan they don't use it anymore you know, there's a an attack on masculinity. They used to lose, use a whole lot of muscular guys in their commercials to promote Under Armour. I'm a former football player, you know. Once a football player, always one. They used to have a slogan that said, will you protect this house? That's what Armour, Under Armour used to say. Will you protect this house? Will you protect this house? And then all around people would shout, I will. Let's try that tonight. Will you protect this house? One more time. Will you protect this house? You know, Bishop Wooden has a policy here at the local church. I call it the no shortcut policy. <laughs> Throughout the course of the day, 
he does not want us to use the sanctuary as a shortcut to get to the other side of the building because this place is not a court to just walk through any kind of way. This is God's house. And Bishop said, don't get caught. One day just not even thinking about it. Heading to the other side, I walked in, took two steps, getting ready to head over to the other side. And it's as if I heard his voice saying that this place is holy. He wasn't here. It was a Tuesday, Monday, a Tuesday, and I stepped back outside the door and made my way around because this is the place where God rests. This place is not no ordinary location. People have devoured God's house, devoured it and made it anything that they want it to be, but this place is holy. From Ezekiel chapter 2 to Ezekiel chapter 8 covers a 14-month 14, a 14 period. 14 months are covered between these chapters. You find in Ezekiel chapter 2 that Ezekiel is called by God. You know, the story sees the wheel in the middle of the wheel, and then by the time we get to chapter 4, Ezekiel sees something and has an experience with God that's past imagination. Chapter 4, verse 4, God gives him some tough instructions after his ministerial call. You know, God gives you more of the plan after he calls you, before he calls you. All you know from the beginning that you got a mighty, fire, a mighty, a mighty, mighty burning fire down in your soul. <laughs> After that, he begins to roll out the plan and tells you what you have to do. Verse 4 of chapter 4 says, Lie thy also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. In other words, Ezekiel, I want you to lay on your left side and take upon you the sins of Israel. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity. According to the number of the days, 390 days. 390 days, God says, Ezekiel, rest on your left side. Take upon you the idolatry, the wickedness, the betrayal of the land. He says, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, verse 6, and when thou hast accomplished this, go a little bit further. Lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days I have appointed thee each day for a year. So for a, total of four, for a total of 430 days, Ezekiel finds himself for 390 days on his left side. And for another 40 days on his right side. And if you know anything about hospice or CNA work, if you are a nurse or ever had one in your family, you know that it's a tough thing when a person lies in one position for a long time. Oftentimes, when you lay in a position for too long in a hospital bed, you develop sores, boils, tension, and arthritis develops in that area. You go numb when you're in that position. I don't know how Ezekiel ate during these 430 days. I don't know if he had to eat laying on his side. But has anybody had, ever had to try to Drink something while laying on your side. It ain't fun. I don't know if you were able to have any communication with his wife during these 430 days. I don't know what he did, but all I know is that the text says for 430 days, take upon you the iniquity of Israel, left side, right side, Judah. 
This man laid there. Isn't it amazing that after God calls you to the work that he has deemed you to do, that you will find yourself in uncomfortable positions? It ain't easy being called. Sometimes you got to lay on your left side for 390 days. Then when that's up and over, God will say you're not finished. Roll over. Anybody ever had the Lord tell them before, roll over? And do it this way. Go through just a little bit more. Ezekiel finds himself in that kind of Season and this leads up all the way to Ezekiel chapter 8. And it's in that moment in verse 1 on September 17th, one day, I hear you laughing, mother, one day after First Lady Wooden's birthday, one day after my mother's birthday. One day after Evangelist Patricia Lester's birthday, all of a sudden, this being showed up in the room and interrupted their elders' council meeting. Read the text. It says, and it came to pass in the sixth day, in the sixth year, the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. They were meeting after Ezekiel had been on his side for 430 days. They come to him to get instruction and wisdom as what they should do. They were watching this display. They were all in that room and all of a sudden it started to get hot in the room. And I'm sure if Ezekiel had a good first assistant, I'm sure his first assistant nudged the leader. Ezekiel and said, do you need the air to be adjusted? Verse 2 says, then I beheld and I looked and lo, the likeness has the appearance of fire. There was a man that presented himself and from his waist down he was in tailored fire. From his waist up he had on bronze that shined like amber. Somebody tell Tim Rogers that God is on fire. See, there's a lot of weak people around here that instead of living something, you want to lower the bar. Let me tell you something tonight. There's no need to lower the bar. What you need to do is rise up to the occasion. I'm sick and tired of watching people get exalted and used and fly from this state and that state preaching nothing to this generation, saying nothing. You know, we saw LeBron James come out there with that purse and those shoes and those socks with his shorts on. We saw him strut out there. But let me tell you something. In a matter of seven days, when we get to Indianapolis, Indiana, it's going to be more of the same. And the reason is because we don't have enough people who are standing in the temple who are willing to say something. That's what's going on. My mama raised a boy. She raised a man, but she ain't raised no punk. Tell you something, it's, it's time for us to deal with this stuff and to say something about it. But instead, we turn our back. To the altar. I almost caught a charge, I believe it was last year, by being in the service. One of the leading flamboyant, flaming homosexuals of the church showed up in the sanctuary and had the audacity to sit right in front of me and turn to my son and drop something on purpose and then ask him to pick it up. I like to knock his head off. But the issue is not that he walks in like that. The issue is not that he comes in and he prances with fingernails. The issue is not that he comes in with a sewing on his head. With all these big hats, with all these big purses, with all these necklaces and all this junk. The issue is that from the pulpit. Nobody 
will say anything. Nobody will speak up. Let me tell you something. We need some warriors behind the desk. I feel something on me. I said I feel something on me. We need some warriors who don't mind fighting. If you lose an appointment, get a day job. If you want nobody to call you back, find something else to do. When the Lord found me, I was on my way to another direction. He said, son, get on back over here. I got a work for you to do. Go back to rally. Submit yourself to Bishop William and fight until I tell you to go. And what we need, we need some more fighters. We don't have enough fighters. And let me tell you something tonight. That when the pulpit doesn't fight, the people will naturally scatter. We are called to contend for the faith. Am I saying anything tonight? Verse 3 says, and he put forth the thumb of a hand and he yanked me up by my hair. And he and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that look up toward the north where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. That was an image, an image at the north gate. Once you got to the church, there was an image there that deified a false god and removed and attempted to remove the glory of the Lord. And you will see throughout the progression of the text that over the course of time that God's glory was diminished as they allowed this image to sit in chief seats in our organization. As these images showed up, no one said anything about it. Feel something on me. Says here in verse 4, and behold, the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. That image that was at the temple was a sex goddess. It was Asherah. You know about Asherah, King Hezekiah? Removed the idolatry from the land, but King Manasseh put it back. Then after Manasseh, his successor, Ammon, comes along and he puts it back. And then here comes the godly king Josiah and he changed it. He got rid of Asherah and burnt it down to powder. But over the course of time as the political and national issues took off the idols made their way back into the temple. People question us and ask why we talk about politics. Well when you read the Bible you will see where when God's men spoke to the issues of the time, they were doing it because the powers of the political elites were trying to pare down on the church. Few men are willing to speak up to that. Deuteronomy 32 and 21 says, they have roused my jealousy by worshiping things that are not God. They have provoked my anger with their useless idols. Now will I rouse their jealousy through people who are not even a people. I will provoke their anger through the foolish Gentiles. And then you see in verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abomination that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. In other words, they're trying to put me out. They're edging me out. They're putting me out of my sanctuary. I have no place to reside. I finally get a, a sanctuary and a temple to reside in through Solomon's temple, but they seen and messed that up. And now I have nowhere to rest. Can't rest in the temple. Can't rest in the priests. Can't rest in the prophets. Can't rest in the people. I have nowhere to rest. Tonight, God is looking for a place to rest. Just want to rest on somebody. And those of you who want this glory of God, God said he's going to fall on you tonight if you desire this glory. And then he says, and he brought me to the door of the court and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall, verse 7. Then he said unto me, son of men, 
So the man digged now in the wall, and when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door, there was a, a dilapidated door in the temple laid waste. There was a hole in there. And God speaks to this prophet and tells him, get a shovel and begin to dig. Dig out that wall. You know, when preaching goes forth, it's synonymous to us digging and pulling you out of your junk behind the stuff that you hide it in. Every preacher ought to have a little dig in them. As a child growing up, my mother asked me one day, she said, boy, do you dig? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, keep on digging. Every now and then, you just got to keep on digging. Keep on preaching until the yoke is destroyed. Verse 9, and he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. Go into that hole in the wall. Verse 10, so I went in. And behold, every form of creeping thing. An abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Everywhere you turn, there were evil images, creeping things, creatures, vultures, birds, serpents, dogs, cats, goats. Gorillas, whatever it was, whatever image they wanted, they were decorated all on the temple's wall in the house of God. Some calligraphist, some artist, some person was used to write these things as you desire. You know, it reminds me of this new tattoo culture. Whatever you want. You want a tattoo of a cross? I'll give it to you. You want a t tattoo of Jesus' face with a crown of thorns on it? I'll draw it on you. If you want a scripture, you want Psalm 23 written on you? I'll draw it on you. Knowing that the scriptures speaks thusly according to these things that we should not make any cuttings or markings or graven images on our flesh. Not on the living and not even on the dead. But here in this text, they had that same spirit. And they were in the temple and this day's culture young people and young adults that we're tattooing our temples know you not that you are bought with a price this is the Lord's temple and there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Let's talk about these 70 men. Well, these 70 men, they were the ancients of Israel. They were the ancients. They were the leaders. They were the fathers. They were the ones who were in charge of everything. You know, oftentimes we give and I'm going to swing the pendulum on both sides. But oftentimes we give this young adult culture a hard time. And we dismiss the errors of the generations that have gone before us. Some of the things that we contend with today and we see in our young adults and our youth are di direct correlation to the failure of the home. These were not young adults or millennials. These were the ancients. These were the ancients of Israel. If we would type, type, type this for the culture, we would say that these individuals were the baby boomers. You know about the baby boomers, don't you? That generation who by statistic, st statistics, they say that they're not adaptable and that they're not collaborative. The baby boomers. That generation where statistics say that most baby boomers would rather not work with another baby boomer because it's hard for two stubborn people to work together. The baby boomers. That generation where, divor where the divorce rate doubled. 
And we're wondering why this millennial generation has no respect for culture, no respect for adults. Well, they saw their homes split under their parents. I know that sight. I know that look. I know that feeling. I know what that courtroom looks like. I know what that sidewalk looks like. I know what it's like to walk on the other side of the street and see my father on the other side. Simply because they didn't make it and as I became a man, I understood some, understood some things a little bit better. But I, over the course of time, as a young man, you see those things and it hurts. Rips your heart out. Can I make myself plain tonight? I saw the hurt. I felt the hurt. I know what it's like to see daddy on one end, mama on one end and wonder what's going on. It was under the baby boomers that families were severed. And now we have a generation who is rebellious, narcissistic. One generation focused on their face. Now another generation focuses on Facebook. One generation found themselves in a sham. And the other generation found themselves on Instagram. One of those other generations was looking for a tweet. And then the next generation got a Twitter. One generation was trying to chat. And then the next generation was trying to Snapchat. It ain't all our fault. That's all I'm saying, Bishop. It ain't all our fault. It ain't all our fault. Let me say this tonight. Just because you have an AARP card, a fresh container of Preparation H, and a ticket to Denny's to get a senior citizen minute meal that does not give you a right to treat the next generation any kind of way. You know, the Bible speaks expressly about the aged women and the aged men teaching the younger generation. But instead of one generation teaching the next generation, there's not enough time for that younger generation to be taught because the former generation has before them, they're still doing their task. And they're too occupied with their task so they can't reach back and pull up the next person and sit them on their knee and train them about what they should do. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer my question because I'm not supposed to question you. So therefore, I don't know nothing. Therefore, I don't know nothing. I'm dumb. We call the millennial generation the dumb generation. But let me tell you something. It's under the millennial generation where we believe in helping our wives. The men do. It's under this generation where we believe in helping out in the things that matter at home because we know what it's like to see daddy go. We know what it's like. But then on the flip side, there's a man in this text by the name of Jazaniah. Jazaniah. Chazaniah, Chazaniah. Chazaniah was the son of Shaphan. I told you the pendulum swings both ways. Shaphan had a son by the name of Ahikam who protected the prophet Jeremiah from being killed. Jeremiah, who begged King Jehoiakim not to destroy Jeremiah's scroll was another one of his boys. He he had another son by the name of Elisha who delivered Jeremiah's scroll to the Jews in Babylon. And, and, and lastly, Nebuchadnezzar appointed Shaphan's grandson, Gedaliah, to be governor of Judah after Jerusalem was destroyed. These are his boys. He had four sons and a grandson. Shaphan was a faithful scribe. He was the chief lay leader who assisted King Josiah in his reforms. He was an everyday sidekick. And every leader needs just one or two sidekicks. Every pastor needs somebody to come roll with him just in case we got to take some idols down. And I don't know about you tonight, but I'm so glad today that I can stand right here and say, I'm glad to be Bishop Williams' sidekick. You know, this man, Jazaniah, messed up. 
the family's name. When you read Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 down to verse 18, you don't see God call anybody by their name until he gets to Jezaniah. You have two names mentioned in the text and one family. And that name that's mentioned is Jezaniah. And Jezaniah was a ring leader. He was worshiping these dark images in the dark. He was the person who instituted it. But his father was not a man that did those things. Neither was his brothers. I want to talk to these young men in here tonight and tell you, don't you go the way of Jezaniah. Don't you allow the world to turn you into a Jezaniah. Jezaniah knew better. He knew better because he had a saved father. He had a saved mother. He had a saved family. He had a family that lived the things of God. But here comes Jezaniah trying to make his own way. And we see Jezaniah in the text. The Bible says that in the midst of them stood Jezaniah. And every man in there had a sensor. They had smoke machines. I'm going to get to it. And they lifted up those sensors and it covered the sanctuary. It covered that chamber. And everything was dark and smoky. Have you seen the new age modern day church? Have you seen what people are doing in these new churches? Everybody says that I want to have a culture cutting. I want to have a model citizen. I want to have a church that matches the franchise image. But let me tell you something tonight. God didn't like dark worship then. And he don't like it now. I come to tell somebody in here tonight to get the smoke out. Look at your neighbor tonight. I've only told you once. Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, get the smoke out. You see, God does not like smoke because he is the smoke. Whenever they built the temple, they couldn't go in because the smoke was in there. And they couldn't worship in the sanctuary until the smoke left. We need to tell these hole-in-the-wall churches. We need to tell these churches that got this stuff set up that you ain't nothing but a hole-in-the-wall church. And your pastor ain't nothing but a hole-in-the-wall preacher. God does not like dark worship. If you believe that, shout something tonight. Let me talk to you. These men were worshiping in the dark. These churches we see a dark worship. Don't understand what's going on. You can't see anybody. You're tripping over your neighbor. You really can't get into the spirit of God unless it's dark. Let me tell you something. When I went to Barnes and Nobles to find out what children are reading, most of the books, 70% of the books that Barnes and Nobles sells to children are books about darkness. Witches, warlocks, and wizards. WWW, witches, warlocks, and wizards. That's the only thing that they're pushing towards our children. But now when you get to the church, it's dark. I thought... They used to sing a song entitled, Walking in the Light. But we don't want to walk in the light anymore. We would rather walk in darkness. We who have been called from the darkness tonight, I dare you to stand up on your feet and thank the Lord for the light. I, I don't know about you, but I know something about darkness I was sinking deep in sin far from that peaceful shore very deeply stay within there sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea 
heard my disparaging cry and from the waters he lifted me now safe am I why would I want to go back to darkness when I almost lost my life in the dark many of y'all know here tonight that if it wasn't for the light you wouldn't be here I know you dressed up on the platform. I know you got your convocation clothes on, but I wish I have some of the light people to worship God right about now. You know, I'm not done with Jazz and I. As a young man in the church, can I testify? I don't talk about this much. But as a young man in the church, even here, I had to deal with some people who recognized that I would rather follow after my chafing than be a Jazaniah. Let me tell you something. Whenever you are connected to a chafing, there will always be someone trying to make you be a Jazaniah. Whenever you serve a chafing, There will always be an old goat, an old prophet, somebody coming and telling you something opposite from what God said. Can I testify tonight? Let me help myself. I remember as a young preacher coming up a room, but there were some who did not like the fact that I stood on everything that my man of God said. I was that one that didn't matter. Even if I didn't understand it, I stood with it because he said it. And there was some who laughed at me. You know when I didn't have the voice that I do have now. You remember when I couldn't sing the songs that I sing now. You remember when I didn't have the anointing that I don't have that I have now. You know what I was like, but listen, I had a zeal for the things of God. I did not know anything about the church of God in Christ, but I knew that I was serving a chafing. But there were some people who tried to talk me to me and try to convince me to be like a Jazaniah. And you know, one day they told me, you know what? You ain't nothing but a joke following all that stuff, man. Let me tell you something. That thing hurt me to the core. They talked about me. They said, all I would hear is they said, you trying to be like Bishop Wooden as if that's something wrong. They said, they tried to talk me out of my anointing. They said, they told me, no, you need to go do something else. They said, they always had something to say. They were always talking. But one day, they said something to me, Bishop, that hit me down in my soul. I almost dropped down to one knee, but I got back up. They hit me with something when they said it. They said something to me that I want to share with you tonight. Is it all right if I share it with you? What I'm getting ready to tell you might help somebody, but is it all right for me to preach my testimony? They said something to me that you don't want to say to a man. They said something to me that every wife knows that you shouldn't say to your husband. They said something to me that really, 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 really got me going. Shaman Bamberg, let me tell you what they said. Can I tell you what they said? If y'all want me to tell you what they said, say, tell you what they said. They said I wouldn't make it. They said I wouldn't be here today. They said I wouldn't amount to anything. But I'm glad to say that I'm pressing on my way and I'm getting stronger each and every day. I come to tell somebody here to stand on the word of God. I want to encourage you tonight that it's not by might, that it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
Does anybody in here want the power to fall on them? If you want the glory, lift your hands up and say, Lord, Lord, let the glory fall on me. Go ahead and worship the Lord tonight. But I'm still holding on. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm still holding on. Been through trouble, but I'm still holding on. Had a little bit of heartache, but I'm still holding on. Had to cry sometimes, but I'm still holding on. Had to pat my own self on the back. But I'm still holding on. Had to go and lay on my left side. But I'm still holding on. Had to lay on my right side. But I'm still holding on. Why? Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They're going to walk and not be weary they're gonna run and not faint say yeah say yeah shout yeah if you're holding on you ought to give god some glory tonight i'm holding on i've been through some stuff i've seen the lightning flash and i heard the thunder roll, seen break a dashing, trying to conquer my soul, but I heard the voice of Jesus bidding me to fight on. He promised, I don't know when, but he promised. I don't know how, but he promised. I don't know the day, but he promised. Never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. Look at your neighbor and say, never. Never alone. You can fight, but you're never alone. You can worship, but you're never alone. Read your word, because you're never alone. Because the glory of the Lord is upon you. Uh-huh. I got to move on in here. Give me five more minutes. We're going to pray. And we got to go on in here tonight. Verse 14 says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women crying for the wrong reason. They were crying for Tamar's. Tamar's was an Akkadian god of rain and fertility. They were gods that were not real. In the seasonal mythological cycle, he died early in the fall and was revived by the weeping of the women. So the date was September 17. When, 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 when the text was written. And these women were in there crying for no reason. They were weeping. Oh, Tamas. Oh, Tamas. Oh, Tamas. Please come back. They were in there crying. And God took Ezekiel there and pointed out these women who were crying for no reason. It was said that if you cried for Tamas, you could bring him back. But that flew in the face of God because God was the one who provided for Israel. God was the one who fed them with the manna. God was the one who gave them the quail. But they were in there crying for this false God. And then verse 16, it says, they brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And when I got in there between the porch and the altar, there were 25 men with their backs to the altar. They had their backs to the 
altar. They turned on God. They left God in the background. And they turned to the east and began to worship the sun. I don't know about you, but I ain't turning my back on Jesus for nothing. Because he's done too much for me. How can I forget what he's done for me? How can I forget how he set me free? These men were in there worshiping the sun, but their backs were to the altar. And when God saw it, he said, Ezekiel, that's it. That's it, man. I'm getting ready to destroy everyone around here. And if you read chapter 9, you see where God called a man with an ink pen and told him to write on every man that should be spared. And then they brought six men and slayed everybody who were in there. They had instruments that slayed people. You thought people started slaying today. They were slaying all the way back in the Bible. But I want to tell somebody in here that I'm not going to turn my back on Jesus because over 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross they stretched my Jesus upon that cross and he died he died he died for my sins and then they put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb but early everybody shout early on Sunday morning he got up with all power, power to heal, power to set free, power to deliver. I can't turn my back on God. I was a poor boy growing up. I didn't have anything, but it's the Lord that gave me what I got. It's the Lord that blessed me with what I have, so I can't turn my back on him. If you're not going to turn your back on the Lord, I dare you to stand up on your feet right now and give God some glory because you're going to keep worshiping him and you're not going to turn on the Lord because he's done too much. Come on, we're getting ready to pray. Come on, worship him, worship him, worship him. We're not going to worship him in the dark, but we're going to worship him in the light. Where my light people at? Give him glory. Give the Lord some glory. Give him glory. Give him some glory tonight. Worship the Lord. Don't worship the S-U-N, son. Worship the S-O-N, son. Jesus, I'll never forget. Jesus, I'll never forget. Jesus. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me, how you saved me. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities, I'll never forget. Let the worshipers go up. Let the worshipers praise Him. Let the worship praise Him. Praise Him in the worship. They were worshiping false gods. But let's worship the King of Kings. Let's worship the King of Kings. We're getting ready to pray at the altar. We're not going to take long. But if you want the glory to fall on you, I dare you to meet me down at the altar. Yeah. Right on. Right on. King Jesus. Right on. Right on. Shucks, right on, King Jesus, he's everything, everything that I need, 
Shekinah glory. Edebo shanebo kushaya. Shekinah glory. Yedebo kosha. Yasane nebo shehem. Shekinah glory. Take control, Lord. Wheel in the middle of a wheel. Wheel in the middle of a wheel. Come on, let's call it down tonight. Shekinah glory. Yeah. 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 Shekinah glory. Let some dew drops. Let some dew drops. Let some dew drops. Y'all looking at me, but look unto Jesus. Let some dew drops. Let some dew drops uh, fall on you. Shekinah. Shekinah glory. Take control of me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I heard in the spirit. I heard in the spirit. The great hymnologist, Elisha Hoffman, in 1900, we're getting ready to pray and go on. But in 1900, Elisha Hoffman got by himself, found a comfortable seat. Rest his body for a while and picked up a pen and started to write. He wrote until he couldn't write anymore. He picked up the pen and said these words. You have long for sweet peace. And for faith to increase and have fervently, earnestly pray, but you cannot have rest. Oh, be perfectly, perfectly blessed. Until all on the altar is laid. Put it all on the altar tonight. God said put it all on the altar tonight. If you have anything up before the Lord, put it all on the altar tonight. And the Lord's going to turn it around.